Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andrew McBride. I'm one of the chief medical residents, and I am honored to introduce today's grand round speaker, Dr. Naresh M. Punjabi. Dr. Punjabi is a professor of medicine and the chief of the Division of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. He attended Northwestern University for his undergraduate education in biomedical engineering and received his MD from the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine in 1991. He completed his postdoctoral training in internal medicine, pulmonary and critical care medicine, and sleep medicine, all at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine in Baltimore, Maryland. He joined the faculty at Johns Hopkins as an instructor of medicine in the Division of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine in 99 and rose to the ranks to become professor of medicine in 2010. He joined us here at the University of Miami as the chief of the Division of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine in 2020. His academic tenure has been marked by significant contributions on the epidemiology of sleep apnea with a particular emphasis on outcomes, including insulin resistance, type two diabetes mellitus and cardiovascular disease. He has also been a co-investigator or a field site PI for multiple multi-center epidemiological studies and randomized clinical trials related to obstructive sleep apnea funded by the National Institutes of Health. Again, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome Dr. Punjabi to the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. Andrew, thank you very much for that introduction. It's uh, good to be here. Um, my typical talk is usually about sleep apnea, but I wanted to pivot today and talk a little bit about something, uh, perhaps even a bigger problem than sleep apnea, and the issue of whether sleep, or whether you think about sleep in quantity and quality of both, and its impact on metabolic risk, particularly the development of type 2 diabetes. Um, I'll really sort of go back uh, two decades to show you how this field has evolved and how what we learned has changed, of course, my career and many other careers focusing on this topic of sleep and metabolic uh, dysfunction. For general line, what I want to do is start with really giving a high-level overview of why sleep is relevant for endocrine function. Uh, sleep is fundamentally uh, regulating many endocrine axes, and I'll highlight some of them to demonstrate the relevance of whether duration of sleep or quality of sleep is fragmented and how that impacts many of these different axes. I'm going to talk about some seminal work that you know jettisoned this area with the effects of sleep deprivation and glucose metabolism, particularly in normal individuals. It's almost about two and a half decades ago that this work started, and it really was some uh, pivoting work that uh, has set off the importance of sleep in, uh, in, in the field of metabolism. We'll talk a little bit about mechanisms and what do we know about the effects of sleep deprivation uh, to glucose metabolism. And then really ask a question, if you were to do recovery sleep after you've been deprived, what happens to metabolism after that? And then come back, go away from the sort of the experimental work, come back to large scale epidemiological stuff. Say, well, what do we know epidemiologically on duration of sleep, quality of sleep and diabetes risk? We'll also then talk about some experimental work on sleep quality and metabolism. And then finally talk about where are we today on the importance of sleep for type 2 diabetes uh, generally. So I'll just get started with a very, very basics introduction so we can anchor everybody about why sleep is relevant for endocrine function. Uh, without going too much into the neurochemistry or the neurobiology uh, of uh, sleep state uh, regulation and what it does, we all know that sleep uh, can be thought about as two components. There's the homeostat. And then there's the pacemaker. Both of these are very relevant from the standpoint of regulation of sleep. The homeostat is almost like a, a, a mechanism for you to overcome the thirst that is developed for sleep and to burn off that thrust. That homeostat is keeping track of, for example, how many hours you've been awake prior to the next period of sleep onset. But then the homeostat can be paid off. The debt can be paid off pretty quickly. Then the circadian rhythm or the supercosmic nucleus, which is the center point for circadian rhythm, kicks in. And for those uh, uh, on this uh, Zoom meeting, we have a Nobel speaker coming, I think Thursday, which is tomorrow, at the five o'clock, the Dean's lecture, who actually it, it was given the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the circadian pacemaker and its uh, impact. So both of these components, the homeostat and the regulator, the supercosmic nucleus, both of these impact uh, hypothalamic pulse generators, which are fundamentally critical to the pituitary and how it then regulates a variety of different endocrine axes, uh, ranging from TSH down to ACTH, of course, sex steroids are also modified. 
Now, the effect of homeostat in the circadian rhythm is not just to the hypothalamic pulse generators. There is an impact on the autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system, therefore, has downstream effects on all endocrine axes. So the base that I want to set up is sleep from the standpoint of homeostasis, circadian rhythmicity is critical for regulation and also regulation of not just the hypothalamus, but also the autonomic nervous system, which then has a downstream impact on a variety of different endocrine axes. Let me just give you some examples. Let's start with this work. A lot of this work was actually done at the University of Chicago by a group that was led, led by Ben Carter, who really sort of stimulated my own career back in 1990s. Um, I took a pivot from what they were doing, but Ev's work was fundamental from the standpoint of raising awareness about the role of sleep, sleep deprivation, on the effects of these different hormonal axes. So let's look at plasma growth hormone. And this figure, what you see on the y-axis, is actually the levels of growth hormone in a, in a bunch of normal individuals. And these black periods that you see are periods of sleep. So during the normal sleep period, ranging from roughly about 11 o'clock to seven in the morning, growth hormone increases. And over the course of the night, it decreases. Now there are some pulsatile issues that go on during the night and there's pulsatility of growth hormone uh, during the day. When you are sleep deprived, which is the second bar, there's absence of that spike. You just don't get it. Now, if you were to then induce daytime sleep, which is this dark colored blue bar, you see that spike in growth hormone again. So what this simply illustrates, the normal physiology growth hormone is tightly regulated to sleep and in specifically slow wave sleep. In its absence, you don't get growth hormone. Again, one illustrative example of what happens. TSH, a little more complicated than the very sort of simplistic view of growth hormone. TSH is very interesting. Its rise occurs well before the sleep period. You'll see in this work here that the, the levels start increasing in the evening time and they really sort of peak towards the, um, towards the onset of the sleep period. And over the course of the night, you see this pulsatility. This pulsatility has been thought to be, again, uh, related to slow wave sleep to some degree. And then over the course of the period, TSH levels come down. Now, if you're sleep deprived, levels are extremely high. So what this suggests is that sleep actually has an inhibitory effect on TSH. I'm keeping things very, very simple at this point just to lay the background of why some of the things that we think about from the standpoint of metabolic function, particularly glucose homeostasis, why will they be messed up? And the point to be illustrated here is that sleep is a fundamental regulator in different ways, the mechanisms are complicated. They're not just unidirectional in the sense that, oh, if you do not get normal sleep, the hormones will go up or down. It's complicated. So in the case of TSH, you'll notice that sleep, which is absent here, does not have that suppressive effect, so you get this massive spike. Now let's go to two other hormones that are very relevant. Let me get into both of these hormones, leptin and ghrelin. Now, leptin uh, is well known from the, as far as because it's made from the adipocytes and it's numerous pleiotropic effects. But one of the most important effects leptin has is suppression of appetite. The other hormone that's very important is ghrelin. Ghrelin is released from endo, en, entero, endocrine cells and it increases appetite. So you sort of have a yin and a yang going on here between what leptin wants to do to appetite and what ghrelin wants to do to appetite. So these figures illustrate what happens in normal individuals with regards to its the, effect, the effects of sleep on these hormones and the effects of meals. So leptin, because it suppresses appetite, you can see after this, after each meal, for example, right? And so your, 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 your sleep here, let's start with sleep. Your sleep here, leptin levels are high. Over the course of sleep period, they come down. The meals that you see here keep that hormone suppressed. And after that meal, over time, it, as that, as that uh, meal uh, you know, is further and further away from the sleep period, the levels start to rise. And ghrelin, on the other hand, as soon as you have a meal, it gets suppressed. Again, another meal, it gets suppressed because it really is an appetite stimulant. So in this sort of cartoon here on the lab, you can see what what leptin and ghrelin do, leptin is really considered so that the hunger hormone feeding back from the gut to the brain. And, and, and leptin sort of, sort of signals satiety 
to the brain itself. So both of these are clearly related to sleep. There are sleep relationships to them. And these relationships get perturbed in the absence of normal sleep or in the presence of fragmented sleep. And I'll show you a case of both. So let's start with sleep deprivation. What do we know? And this really dates back to Ev's work from Chicago. And, and again, it was some of the seminal work that was published in The Lancet that I wanted to show you. What they did was something phenomenal. They took 11 healthy volunteers. They restricted them for about four hours of sleep. And then they let them recover for about 12 hours. So it was an interesting paradigm. It's not, I'm not necessarily sure if I would have done this from a standpoint of experimental paradigm, but it is an interesting one. So they deprived people, normal men, of four, four hours, six nights, and 12 hours, six nights. And they assessed a variety of different outcomes, carbohydrate metabolism, and I'll show you what they did, adrenal function, heart rate variability. Here's the study protocol. I think it's worthwhile looking at this. They had three baseline nights that you see B1, B2, B3. They had six nights of deprivation. These sort of orange bars tell you the hours that they're allowed to sleep. And then they have these recovery seven days where they were you know, really tracking these individuals, letting them sleep 12 hours or more. And then what they do in the last two nights, last two days rather, assess metabolic function. So what they're doing is they're getting baselines they're seeing effects of sleep deprivation and then again, effects of sleep fragmentation, effects of sleep extension. Here's what happens. When you actually uh, uh, assess the response to breakfast under sleep debt versus sleep extension conditions, and these are glucose curves after breakfast. So these are really sampling at particular intervals, looking at 9 a.m. on. So here's what you see after breakfast. Glucose levels, of course, go up as they should, and they come down over time. The second graph here is insulin secretion rate. And again, you see insulin going up in response to the glucose load and over time it comes back down. What you can do is you can do some integration of areas. You can look at the area under the curve uh, to really get an understanding of what is happens and happening from a sample of a composite profile. And this is commonly done in the field, looking at area in the curves of the glucose or area in the curve of the insulin. So the area under the curve for glucose was much, much larger under sleep debt conditions, and the values are shown here, than sleep extension. So what this suggests is that glucose tolerance, the ability to glucose sort of decay itself, is much more impaired. Glucose levels stay higher for a longer period of time under sleep debt conditions than sleep extension conditions. You can kind of also get a feeling for the peak levels are higher, the overall area is different, et cetera. What's interesting is the insulin secretion rate, at least in response to an oral load. Oral loads are very different than intravenous loads. Oral load insulin secretion was really not different, at least from a statistical standpoint. Limited sample size, but the message you take away here is that glucose tolerance is impaired after being sleep deprived for six nights, about four hours. Now, if you look at intravenous glucose loads, you can do the same thing. You can go ahead and actually inject glucose. That's what you see at this time point here. And then monitor glucose levels very commonly. And we do this in our laboratory every two minutes. And there's a decay over time, over three hours. You can study this under sleep debt and sleep extension conditions. And what they learned was, when you look at the area under the glucose curve, a metric of glucose tolerance, you see that sleep dead conditions, tolerance was much less. And you can see that the decay is slower than the decay in the sleep extension curve, right? So what you're seeing is that sleep debt, whether you look at an oral load or an IV load, impairs the ability to mobilize, to, to metabolize glucose. And when you look at intravenous uh, glucose loads, you can actually measure what's called the first phase of the insulin curve, where fundamentally insulin is being released from the pancreas itself. And then you can integrate that area. The first phase of the insulin curve is also, interestingly enough, dampened. So not only is glucose tolerance lower, insulin secretion is also impaired. So you've got these two things going on. Now, there's a third thing called glucose effective. Now, what this is, is the ability of glucose to mobilize across the cellular membrane independent of insulin action. Glucose can move intracellularly, either through the effects of insulin or independently without the effects of insulin. In fact, the brain is one area where glucose transport occurs independent of insulin action. 
So that too, and this is a mathematical derived formula from something called minimal model, a mathematical model proposed by um, a group of colleagues uh, at Northwestern, in fact, when they developed the model um, to look at insulin action, glucose action. And again, the model says, what happens if your insulin is zero? Can glucose move? And the answer is yes. And we can derive a mathematical parameter. Finally, we can also look at insulin sensitivity. How sensitive is a particular cell or, or, or organ or the whole body? This is whole body sensitivity insulin. And you see is that it was not significant. Insulin sensitivity represents the ability of insulin to mobilize glucose intracellular. So the key messages from this are that glucose um, tolerance is impaired, insulin secretion is impaired, the ability to move glucose intracellular independent of insulin is impaired, albeit no differences in insulin sensitivity. So these are the conclusions that these folks made. And I, at this point, I actually met the, the Chicago group and as this paper was being published, uh, decreased glucose clearance or metabolism or disposal, same word, decrease in the acute insulin response to glucose. So basically insulin is not released as much. And turns out there's some other things that they did and I'll get into a little later. They also noted that there was an increase in the cortisol in the evening after the period of sleep deprivation. And again, more details to follow. What was interesting is that they looked at these effects in normal people and they found older adults had similar effects. So they compared and did sort of drew an analogy to saying the effects of sleep deprivation for this very limited duration is e equivalent to a significant component of aging. Uh, again, they were trying to draw an analogy to say, well, what does this really mean? So why does this happen? What are the mechanisms that are underlying the effects of sleep deprivation to glucose metabolism? Now, there are several proposed mechanisms, and all of them seem to be pretty much active. There is uh, and I'll go through some of them very briefly. There's a decrease in brain glucose utilization. There's clearly uh, alterations in sympathovagal balance. Uh, specifically, there is an increase in sympathetic activity. And I briefly mentioned that cortisol levels are higher in the evenings. There's going to be alterations in leptin and gorilla, uh, which really will motivate differences in appetite. And then there's some evidence that deprivation, fragmentation of sleep can alter uh, systemic inflammation subclinically, of course, but these two can have effects on, on the glucose homeostasis and the insulin axis. So what do we know about brain glucose utilization? Well, we know this much. The brain is the major site of non-insulin dependence. This is that thing where in insulin is not necessary. So we know that if you look at studies from uh, using PET, PET data do show that if you deprive people of, of a sleep, there's a decrease in brain utilization. So if you utilize less, there's gonna be more glucose hanging around. So again, disposal as a whole is down when you think about what happens. What happens to sympathovagal balance? Here's a really interesting figure from some of the latter work that they did. If you look at heart rate variability, heart rate variability is an important concept normal people or normal heart rate variability should be high. Basically what you're doing is looking at the effects of sinus uh, arrhythmias and, and having a depressed level of heart rate variability is a bad or abnormal thing. So high heart rate variability, sorry, so high RR is equal to decreased heart rate variability. What you're seeing here is what's called the RR interval here. And what you notice is that after four hours of sleep deprivation, you know, there is a high level, high degree of this value. And of course, it decreases as you go into sleep because things sort of quiet, quieten down. But as soon as the sleep period is over, the levels come back up after you've been sleep deprived. So fundamentally, you're running a very high level uh, uh, of sympathovagal imbalance. In normal people or normal sleep duration, let's say 12 hours or more, there's somewhat of a status quo with a nocturnal dip, which, is express, which you would expect in sympathovagal balance. So this figure shows where you should be. And what you're seeing is something very elevated. So people that are sleep deprived have decreased heart rate variability, which fundamentally translates to increase in sympathetic activity, or because we are not directly measuring it, or decrease in parasympathetic activity. Heart rate variability provides a metric of sympathovagal balance, not necessarily a direct assessment of sympathetic 
or parasympathetic activity. But for most part, people that have done measurements of direct sympathetic activity using uh, nerve recordings have shown that sleep deprivation in animal models leads to an increase in sympathetic. So this imbalance that you see in humans is clearly driven by sympathetic nervous system activation and not so much parasympathetic withdrawal. And that, that was also shown here. If you look at duration of sleep and compare four hours, eight hours, and 12 hours, you can see sympathovagal balance improves as duration of sleep improves or increases. Now, let's talk about cortisol since we briefly mentioned that. Evening cortisol, again, this is the value around four or five in the evening, the next day after you've been sleep deprived, you see cortisol levels the highest uh, with four hours of time in bed versus eight hours versus 12 hours. So very simply put, you can understand some of the mechanisms that could be driving this uh, effect of sleep deprivation, clearly increase in sympathetic activity, which has huge downstream effects on glucose release, insulin action, but also you can now see that there's an effect of cortisol also uh, from the effects of sleep deprivation. So two of these are very simple mechanisms that one can use to explicate the association between why sleep deprivation could impair glucose homeostasis. Well, we mentioned this issue about evening cortisols, but we could get into that a little more. You can actually understand some of this stuff. This is a data from partial or total sleep deprivation. If you get eight hours of sleep, all of us know that cortisol levels start increasing towards the end of the sleep period and are highest when we wake up. Now, after you deprive individuals of sleep or have total sleep deprivation, and you look at evening cortisols, and again, using this technique of area under the curve, comparing normal sleep, partial deprivation, and then total sleep deprivation, you find that there is an increase in plasma cortisol, and that continues in this direction where there is an impact. Clearly, simply put, just with even one to two days of sleep deprivation, you can have this hypercortisolemia in the evening, which is not, of course, a healthy input to the glucose or insulin axis. So hypercortisolemia, the next day after sleep deprivation is yet another mechanism that could do it. But leptin and ghrelin are not just innocent bystanders, they too are involved. And in fact, they contribute substantially with glucose metabolism um, and sleep deprivation and also sleep fragmentation. So here's data looking at what leptin does, what cortisol does, and what a marker of insulin resistant called HOMA. This is a marker, which is a very simple mathematical product of insulin times glucose divided by a uh, adjustment factor of 22.5. And what you see here are leptin profiles with four hours of bed, eight hours of bed, and 12 hours of bed. Now the leptin axis is the easiest one to see, as we saw before there is an impact of leptin on appetite. So as leptin decreases, now remember, leptin is supposed to decrease your appetite. So an increase in leptin is a good thing. It's not gonna, it's not gonna motivate the appetite. When you are sleep restricted, that suppression of leptin that you're seeing in this left upper panel here is actually gonna motivate an increase in appetite. We've talked about cortisol, area under the curve for cortisol is the highest in the evening hours, four hours in bed, less of course with eight hours in bed, and then of course the best at, at with 12 hours in bed. And similarly, when you look at this marker of insulin resistance, it is worse with sleep deprivation and much better with eight or 12 hours. So the key things to take away from this work really do over the course of a decade uh, from 1999 to 2009 is that the, the, the effects of sleep deprivation in an acute setting can really trigger many different axes. It's not just the hypothalamic. It's not just impairing sympathetics. It's, it's also impairing the adrenal axis. It's impairing control of appetite. And we're going to get into also ghrelin in a moment. So when you look at experiment paradigms where you fundamentally compare, let's say now 10 hours in bed versus four hours in bed, and you actually infuse glucose at a steady state rate and sample, you can also ask people, how do they feel with regards to hunger and appetite? Because these hormones are clearly changing. And the question is, do these changes translate into actual subjective experiences and what we do with regards to appetite and the type of foods that we choose. Are we more prone towards high carb, high carb 
intake under sleep deprived conditions? I bet most of you would answer absolutely. We tend to reach for those high carb foods if we're sleep deprived. Here's the data to show that actually why that happens. Again, under sleep deprivation, which is orange, you see a suppression of leptin. Again, not a good thing. After you know having extended sleep, leptin levels are high. High leptin levels suppress appetite. The converse of that is the ghrelin axis. What happens with sleep deprivation, orange, ghrelin levels are high. If you recall back to some previous slides, that ghrelin level, high ghrelin level, increase in the sensation of hunger after sleep deprivation. So deprivation does the worst thing you can ever imagine from a standpoint of how we how these hormonal axes really regulate our appetite and hunger. And again, this is a steady state. So everything is being held at one level. There are no meals here, et cetera, over time. This is a steady state in normal individuals. What's interesting is if you now track symptomatic issues about hunger and appetite, you see exactly what you would expect. During sleep-deprived conditions, which is basically orange, you see that hunger is higher and global appetite is also high. So this tracks, these are subjective ratings, this tracks what we see metabolically on these 24 hour profiles is that it, it is really impacting how we sense and what we do in fact. Uh, downstream effects of this are that we crave carbs. And some really nice data published by the same group is that if you were to present an array of food items, individuals that are sleep deprived will really gear towards or move towards high carb diets. And, and this can be shown that the changes in the ghrelin to leptin ratio, remember this is that yin yang going on, is really interested in how much hunger you have. The more ghrelin to leptin ratio, the higher the value of hunger after just being deprived of sleep for two days. So this makes sense. This has a lot of meaning from the standpoint of diabetes risk, because if you're gonna crave our high carb diets, you're gonna now also be impaired with your ability to mobilize that glucose. The, the, you're starting on the pathway to developing type two diabetes. I wanna just write this table up here. And this is the data that they showed about what happens as far as percentages with regards to change in the leptin levels, satiety hormone, change in ghrelin, appetite hormone. Remember leptin is supposed to sort of suppress that appetite and ghrelin is supposed to you know, increase that thing. So what you see after sleep deprivation is things that you don't want to see. These signs are in the opposite direction. So you have a suppression of leptin and an increase in, in ghrelin. Just keep an eye on these numbers, 18%, 28%. I'm going to come back to that because I'm going to draw a parallel to this as what we know at the population level in people who are not sleeping the normal amounts of seven to eight hours of sleep. And here's the data to start with that. These are cross-sectional data from a large epidemiological study called the Wisconsin Sleep Cohort Study, where they looked at leptin levels and average nightly sleep reported by the cohort. And what you see, these are adjusted values, statistical adjustment accounting for a variety of different confounders such as age, sex, body mass index. People who sleep less, six hours, I'm pointing to that, tend to have lower leptin levels compared to those that are sleeping eight hours. What's really interesting is that there's this positive association when you go to nine hours or more, the levels are really, really high. I wanna caution you in over-interpreting that at this point because there are some concerns that when you start sleeping nine to 10 hours, that is a marker of something. But nonetheless, the key thing that I think that we took away from this in the field was in the, in the, in the field, in large epidemiological studies, we are seeing the same things that were observed in the, in the experimental world of normal healthy individuals, there seems to be associations. Now, interestingly, now the same cohort of, of almost, uh, you know, a thousand people or so, the, the, the opposite was seen in ghrelin levels. As duration of sleep goes down towards four hours, ghrelin levels, again, uh, the hormone that's sort of activating appetite, really stimulating hunger is higher. So epidemiologically, we're seeing what we see experimentally. Now I wanna go back to that table. I'm gonna show you what the experimental work showed versus what the epidemiological work showed. And it's a parallel. Again, that study was a limited study, small, very tight uh, experimental work. And it showed that there's a suppression of leptin and there's an increase in ghrelin. And look what we see on the other side. On the epidemiological side, we see that leptin levels are also down. Now again, these are not causal because this is a correlational and cross-sectional study. Leptin levels are down and ghrelin levels are up. 
just drawing some parallels that there are consistencies among what we're saying experimentally and epidemiologically. So the next question is, look, if you're gonna be sleep deprived, can you actually fix this and improve glucose tolerance if you extend your sleep? Uh, and that's been a really interesting question. For the most part, things do get better. So let's look at that. This is uh, work again from uh, Josie, who uh, I work with, and also Esther Tasali at Chicago. And they did something very interesting, and they asked that simple question. What happens with normal sleep, black bars, sleep restriction, red bars, and recovery sleep? What's interesting is when you sleep restrict people, and this is insulin sensitivity, it in fact does go down. As you recover sleep, it goes back up. The acute insulin response to glucose, which is very highly variable of a parameter, didn't really show much. Again, this is the ability for insulin to mobilize glucose, and this is whole body sensitive insulin. We can fractionate that into the liver, the muscle, et cetera, but this is whole body sensitive insulin. And this is the response, the first phase. Now, the product of this, this AIRG, AIRG comes from the first letter of each of these things, the acute insulin response to glucose. When you take this product and you, or rather this parameter and multiply it into sensitivity, you get what's called the disposition index. The disposition index is very critical in the field of diabetes. It is a one of the most deterministic or well-established risk factors for developing type 2 diabetes. A lower level disposition clearly indicates an increased risk for diabetes. So it's not surprising to see that the disposition index followed the trend of insulin sensitivity because this was status quo. Again, the case in point from this article was that, gee, you know, you can sleep deprived, but then you can sleep extend, and it seems to recover, at least in these very acute settings. So what do we know? You know, I've shown you some epidemiological data. What do we know about diabetes risk over time, over decades and, and, and years? What do we know about that? This is our own work from the Sleep Heart Health Study, which we started in 1994 and are to date still analyzing. In a subsample of about 1,000 or 1,500 individuals, we had data on sleep time and then by self report We also had data on glucose tolerance and diabetes using glucose measurements. And we had data from the standpoint of fasting data, two-hour data, insulin levels. So we wanted to know, does sleep, the duration of sleep in a large epidemiological study, which included Framingham, uh, cardiovascular health, uh, ERIC, uh, the New York cohort, does does sleep, sleep duration matter? Uh, and what we learned is as follows. This is a complex table, but I'll simplify this. And I've highlighted the key thing that I want you to pay attention to is that this, this sort of model three, these are different statistical models, but model three is probably the most important because it's accounting for many, many variables. Again, epidemiological study, correlational analysis, cannot assume causations and so forth. What you notice is people who sleep less than five hours or more had a higher prevalence of type 2 diabetes. Uh, in fact, you also saw the same thing for people who were sleeping about six hours. Here we go, nine hours or more, the diabetes uh, uh, odds ratio was still elevated beyond one. Now that doesn't mean if you sleep more, you get diabetes. That's not the point here. This is a cross-sectional study. What we have learned over the years is that people who are now sleeping nine, 10, 11 hours, there's something pathological. There's something that's going on that's marking them to get to that extra sleep duration. So quote unquote, nine plus hours doesn't mean you're gonna develop diabetes. It's a marker for something else that's going on. The, the associations with impaired glucose tolerance, because we did have glucose tolerance data, was sort of lukewarm. We didn't see much with the IGT. We didn't see much with five hours or less. There was an association with six, and of course there was an association with 1.88, you know, with the odds ratio 1.88, but those were sleeping more than none. Fundamentally, the key takeaways from this large epidemiological confirmation is that when you, when you look at individuals that sleep less than six or more than nine, there seems to be a higher prevalence of diabetes and impaired glucose tolerance. Now, whether that's causal uh, could not be determined from this study, but future work that we have done and others have done, I'll show you, does confirm the incidence, not just the prevalence of type 2 diabetes. So here's another data just to show you the global and, and generalizable results that people have generated. This is a study from Taiwan that looked at their equivalent of what we have in the U.S. called the NHANES study. Their study is called the Nutrition and Health Survey. This was done in Taiwan. They've got this probability sampling of, of, of the country. It was a cross-sectional study here also 
1,500 participants, and they asked the question, does habitual sleep duration really relate to prevalent type 2 diabetes? And what you'll see is they pretty much confirm what we had earlier seen. They went a couple little steps further than we did. Again, a complicated table, but I'll simplify this and focus on the leftmost part. The leftmost part that I've identified in this red box is people sleeping less than five hours or, or even less than that. And what you notice is that there are differences from the standpoint of where you are in the age level, how old you are, whether you're a man or woman, and whether concurrent to sleep duration, are there other issues of sleep? So what they found is that if your duration of sleep is less and you have interrupted or disruptive sleep, there was a higher prevalence odds ratio for type 2 diabetes in these individuals. Men, but not women, were noted to find to have this associations. And the younger folks, the younger folks had a higher problem odds than the middle age or older folks. Again, somewhat consistent to what we were seeing in our sort of US-based cross-sectional work uh, and you know, confirmatory with other studies that have been going on. Now the question is, we've talked about duration. We haven't talked about quality. We haven't talked about, well, what happens if you wake up quite a bit during the night? And what, you know, quantity of sleep is important, but what about quality? Now, quality of sleep has been examined in multiple studies in population-based work. The problem with quality of studies is that it's really hard to assess unless you have an objective piece of data, such as an actigraph, which most studies don't have. So much of the quality work has been done based on self-report as the key exposure variable. Here's a study from uh, Germany, which was called the Monitoring Trends and Determinants of Cardiovascular Disease, the Monica study. It's a population registry. And what they did is they said, look, we wanna know if, you, if your sleep is disturbed or not. And they defined it as having trouble falling, initiating, or maintaining sleep using a three-point Likert scale. They looked at a sample size of about 8,000 some folks, all patients, all individuals, sorry, in this registry did not have diabetes. And they followed these people over a 10 year period. What they were interested in is does self report diabetes, does self report sleep to disturbance relate to incident diabetes? Again, we've not talked about incident, yes, but we only talk about prevalent diabetes. But here's where their data shows. They made a lot of statistical adjustments because of epidemiological studies. And what you see are these different models for each sort of adjustment. And they related initiating sleep and maintaining sleep separately. And what they found was, sure enough, when you look at all statistical adjustment after going through dyslipidemia adjustment, BMI, it's interesting whether you look at men or women, the most adjusted, the most accounting uh, model for maintaining sleep uh, was uh, revealing a higher risk for diabetes in men and women. So the key takeaway from this is that poor sleep quality or difficulty maintain, maintaining sleep during the night is associated with a higher incidence. This is the first time I'm gonna use that word incidence. Mostly it's been prevalent so far, incidence of type 2 diabetes. And again, this has been replicated in multiple populations to say, look, what does sleep really do? But this is one example of, of, of the registry. And their key, key takeaway was, we don't see problems initiating sleep as a problem from the standpoint of metabolic uh, abnormalities, but sure, maintaining sleep seems to be a risk factor for type 2 diabetes in men and women from the general population. Here's another example of a, another study from Sweden, just to give you an illustrative comprehensive view. This was strictly a male cohort of 6,000 individuals followed for 15 years now. They too looked at assessments of self-reported problems falling or now the use of hypnotics, which is a marker for having difficulty maintaining sleep. So what they did now was look at diabetes definitions now objectively using fasting glucose measurements. And again, looking at what I would call sort of that final uh, answer or, or model from their uh, analyses of incident data, and they use logistic regression, yes or no development of diabetes. What's interesting is if you look at difficulty falling asleep or the regular use of hypnotics was associated with an odds ratio of 1.52. But what does that mean? It says that those individuals that have problems falling asleep or use hypnotics, which basically is a marker for having um, poor sleep quality, um, and there's a 50% higher likelihood for these people developing diabetes. When you have both types, yeah, the odds ratio is higher, but not sort of reaching uh, so significance, having marginal values, and you can see the p-value there. Of course, age is a well-established uh, risk factor for developing incident diabetes.
But this sort of is in line with the other work that you've seen now in the, in the prevalence world, the German work on the incidence, and now this work from Sweden, I'm looking at incidence for diabetes, a sleep quality. Um, and again, th th there's quite a bit of this stuff over time. We can also use the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index to look at sleep quality. It's about a five, point, uh, six, five or six uh, item questionnaire. You can divide the scores up into not having uh, great quality, which is this high number here, or having good quality sleep. And you'll see over the course of, of four years, the ability to develop diabetes is much higher in individuals with poor sleep quality given this survival curve versus that survival curve. So here, again, we are seeing poor sleep quality. Different cohorts seem to be associated with the development of diabetes which is important because all of those experimental studies have never really been able to confirm because they can't, what happens long-term? They're very short-term, acute physiological experiments. Now the question is, what are the mechanisms? What, why is it that if you have bad quality sleep, what increases the risk? And this is something that was of interest to us. So I embarked on a pretty uh, interesting experiment that I don't think I could ever repeat again, where we took 11 men uh, and we did the following. We did baseline assessments using intravenous glucose tolerance tests. We gave them a night of quiet sleep. Then we fragmented their night uh, sleep for two nights and we reassessed their sleep quality. Well, how do you fragment sleep in normal people? It's very difficult. We hid these buzzers underneath their beds, um, underneath the mattresses, and we would buzz them uh, every two minutes. And it's really obnoxious, it's toxic, it's annoying, and no one should do this. Uh, as a side thing, I'll notice that uh, the Applied Physics Lab at Johns Hopkins got interested because they thought this would be an interesting interrogation technique um, because it seems to meet the Geneva Conventions for prisoners that you don't take away their sleep, but you can disrupt sleep. We have published a paper on that demonstrating that we don't impair their sleep, but we do impair their cognitive abilities and their ability to respond, and therefore they tend to be more truthful in their responses. This is a very complex tracing of a lot of EEG data to show you what their EEG is doing during sleep. You'll see this very long tracing of EEG, it's compressed. And all this red stuff is arousals. All these little blue things are stimulus. So we are literally buzzing that bed. It's very, it's, it's very noxious. And what we found is something fascinating. Insulin sensitivity is down, insulin secretion is up, right? Fascinating findings. So fundamentally, if you do, if you disrupt someone's sleep, I, I didn't say sleep deprivation. We did not induce sleep deprivation. Sleep deprivation, sleep amount was seven to eight hours. Sleep fragmentation induces impairments in sensitivity. And there's a compensatory response, which is supposed to be normal. Let me say that again. When my sensitive insulin goes down, my pancreas, my beta cell is going to respond appropriately with releasing more hormone, with releasing more insulin. And we find that trend beautifully here. So we learn, at least in a very simplistic way, that if you just fragment someone's sleep for two nights, you can impair insulin sensitivity. That means glucose cannot mobilize into the cell, even though insulin's present. We actually see insulin tries to compensate, or the beta cell tries to compensate for that lower insulin sensitivity. We found, like some of the previous work in deprivation, I wanna make the distinction between deprivation and fragmentation. These are two different things. Fragmentation also seems to impair the ability to glucose to move inside intracellularly, independent of insulin action. That's what this parameter is. I'll tell you, I was, one of, I was subject number one, it increases your sympathetic activity. Your heart rate the next day or the following days of fragmentation is really high. Um, and in fact, uh, one of the participants uh, who was a, a Iraq veteran came to me after we uh, finished the protocol. I said, you know, I was going to find those damn things under the bed and I'm going to destroy them. I was going to destroy them. I'm going to come find you so you never do this to anybody else ever again. So it's a very noxious stimulus. It really increases the sympathetic drive. We also found cortisol levels in the morning are important. Very stressful. Fragmentation of sleep is very, very stressful. So where are we now today with all of that evidence where quality, quantity, both, epidemiologically cross-sectional studies, epidemiologically incident studies, or cohort studies have found relationships, where are we now? I wanna summarize all of this uh, by really showing a recent meta-analysis that was published on this topic about sleep 
and comparing sleep to other risk factors for diabetes development. I thought this was really kind of novel because this kind of pools things together in one place and says, well, does it matter? Is it as bad as obesity? Is it as bad as family history? So let's go through this. Duration of sleep. And again, remember, insulin type 2 diabetes. So here are the pool estimates. Uh, uh, if you sleep less than five hours, you have about a 48% more chance for developing diabetes. There's still a risk um, at six hours. And again, there you go, that nine hours or more showing up as that, that flag of still higher risk. I think that's a marker. The nine hours is a marker of something else and not per se in the pathogenic or putative pathway of causality. Okay, so let's look at overall sleep quality. These are data from numerous studies over the years. And here's what we learned about poor sleep quality. The pool, the overall pooled uh, uh, estimate for the entire, all these studies available across a couple of decades is that there's a 40% chance of developing diabetes if there's reported poor sleep quality. I haven't talked anything about sleep apnea. It's something that, of course, I've spent a lot of time on. And I'll just quickly briefly mention this with one slide. Sleep apnea is an independent risk factor. Odds are about 2.0 for developing type 2 diabetes into the future. But coming back to other things related to sleep, we haven't talked about shift work, but look at shift work. The pooled estimates across all these studies is 40% higher risk for those that have shift work. And again, there's interesting, right? Non-specified shift work or rotating shift work. The estimates are slightly different, 1.22 versus 1.40. So these individuals are also at a higher risk for developing type 2 diabetes. Let's come back to that quality stuff, difficulty initiating sleep. If you look at epidemiological data, the odds ratio, or at least the risk ratio here, sorry, is 1.55, demonstrating that there is a higher risk. If you pull all the epidemiological work, if you look at difficulty maintaining sleep, uh, again, higher risk across studies, 74% higher chance for developing type 2 diabetes. But this is the really neat figure, right? I think this is perhaps the most important figure in the field, which says, okay, let's line them all up. Let's line up being overweight. Let's line up being family history, maintaining sleep, initiating sleep, and so forth. And let's plot out their risk ratios. Let's plot them out. Okay, so that's interesting. So, of course, weight is the biggest driver. That's what you see here. Family history is the next biggest driver. But look at the next one, maintaining sleep quality. Look at the next one, initiating sleep. A very non-specific definition of sleep, sleep apnea, 1.45. There is that sleep duration, 1.45. So what you're seeing here is that poor sleep quality, along with the disorder of sleep apnea, along with duration, all seem to have a non-trivial risk, and it's sort of competing. But when you start getting down to things like physical inactivity, you, you know, people worry about, my gosh, you have to be more active. Look at what the pooled estimates are. Physical activity is 1.20. So comparing problems with sleep, 1.7 to 1.2, it, it's impressive. This is not a trivial shift in the risk spectrum for developing a chronic condition that has significant downstream implications from the standpoint of cardiovascular disease. And that's important. Physical inactivity is less. Shift work falls roughly at that point, rotating shift work. And again, getting to that normalish seven hours of, of, of uh, sleep duration was at 1.05. Again, this is a very neat slide because it kind of compares all of the things across. So I'm about almost out of time. I wanted to say this, uh, and I apologize for being somewhat cursory, but time is limited. There is zero doubt today, and I, I will learn more about this tomorrow evening at five o'clock in the Dean's Lecture, that sleep is absolutely integral, not just from a homeostatic perspective, but also circadian perspective for our endocrine function. Uh, it remains without doubt um, that depriving sleep, uh, de deprivation of sleep in acute and chronic settings clearly impairs glucose disposal and predisposes in clinical epidemiological studies to diabetes risk. And I write the word risk, not just burden or prevalence. And there are numerous mechanisms. We can get into sympathetic vagal balance. We can get to the cortisol axis. We can pick up appetite hormones. All of this converges on improving the disposal of, uh, or worsening the disposal of glucose. Of course, recovery sleep, yeah, it has positive effects. And there's zero doubt that large-scale studies 
clearly support linking duration, quantity, and quality of diabetes risk. So I think today, after almost two and a half decades of work, uh, much of which, which I have watched from the sidelines and I've kind of taken off in my own direction with apnea and the effects of hypoxia, there's zero doubt that sleep as a whole, quality and quantity, is vital for normal glucose homeostasis. And impairments clearly lead to increase of risk. This, this last statement sort of encompasses the fact that there are other reasons that sleep is disrupted. Heart failure, having a stroke, uh, having sleep apnea, having restless leg syndrome, all conditions that are common with age and prevalent comorbidity, they really sort of come together and increase metabolic risk. With that, I will stop and open up for questions. Dr. Punjabi, thank you for a absolute wonderful grand rounds that was engaging and didactic and very clearly presented. I note um, there are lots of things one could comment on, and um, but maybe I'll start with this. Um, and I know most of these studies that you described were done with uh, with BMI matched controls and age matched controls. So any perturbation in the metabolism that was seen is really due specifically to, to the sleep parameters. But one of the things that I can't help but think might be involved are the social determinants of health. When we think about the likelihood of populations that have obesity and diabetes, and we think about the most needy of our population that probably have sleep maladjustments or sleep deprivation, it probably are in those individuals that have, I would think, uh, although this is a hypothesis and perhaps there's data to support this, would be in those individuals that have the highest social determinants of health uh, that, that are negatively, uh, adversely negative affected. Is there any data to show which came first, the chicken or the egg? So there's a lot of buried in that question, but let me just sort of tease it up by giving you what's known about, not just, we don't know much about social determinants of health and how that feeds into the metabolic risk. Um, but I will tell you this much. In our own work, longitudinally, when we look at duration and look at stratification by body mass index, we know that the effects of deprivation quality are accentuated in those people that are overweight and obese. So it's a double hit for not, which sort of makes sense, right? So I say that just to show you that there's data out there that does confirm two hits are worse than one. So with that as a background, yes, I think that the social determinants of health probably uh, is a much more complex phenomenon where in, in fact, those individuals have a high propensity for body weight, clearly a greater propensity for sleep issues. And I think it is through those mechanisms that has really been a topic of discussion um, that may be meeting some of the metabolic risk, or if not quite a bit of the metabolic risk in those individuals that are, uh, you know, either, uh, yeah, that have those underrepresented factors. So right. we know obesity is gonna inflate all of this stuff. Being overweight and not sleeping well is worse than being, normal weight and not sleeping enough. Dr. Alex Abreu. Uh, thank you, Dr. Weiss. Dr. Dr. Punjabi, great lecture. Quick question for you. How, I think th this is a, a great stepping stone for our providers actually to understand how important uh, sleeping well and having a schedule is. So how, how do you see that we could implement a, a better quality of sleep for the overall faculty? Because I, I think that that's the key point that uh, in the department we had the other day talking about this in baskets, uh, shuffling, shuffling, so we have less activities to do it. But how do we actually inf show to our providers that if they don't have a good quality of sleep, they'll actually not have a good quality of life? So and they get ornery with their chair, absolutely. Well, well, well there's, there's a lot buried in there. And one of the most dreaded thing I was hoping that would never occur is that question, because I know I would be put in this spot about <laughs> issues with the sleep and, and schedules and what happens. Look, there's no doubt that uh, the evidence is clear. Uh, so for those that are rotating, for those that are not sleeping enough, it's hard to not look at the evidence. The question is, how do you mitigate that? The evidence shows you can mitigate it. So cycling is important. You can overcome some of these acute effects. So if you have a, a short night, you need to figure out whether you can sort of go ahead and 
sort of input or at least you know, give yourself that recovery phase so that you can come out of that stress that you went through, that activation that just occurred can be extinguished if you give it enough time. So my very simplistic answer to a much more complex and loaded question is cycling is probably the best. Yes, you are very versatile biologically. You can deal with stressors. You can overcome them. I'll leave it at that because this is complicated. I don't have a one size fit all. We should do this for the faculty. Everybody's going to be different duration, cycling, circadian dysrhythmicity. There's so much involved here that it's hard to Thank just call it a blanket answer. Thank you. Dr. Marcus, last question. Yeah, actually, this is a little bit related to, I had a couple of questions. This is related to what Dr. Abru just asked about. There was an interesting article in that great, oops, sorry, um, the great medical journal, The Atlantic. <laughs> so not a medical journal, but um, I, they talked about sort of, sort, of, sort of more from an anthropological point of view this whole concept that you go to bed at you know nine or ten and you wake up early in the morning and perhaps you know and a lot of people have wake up at two a.m. or three a.m. they can't get that full eight hours but they could do a nap and is this you know is is part of the problem we're seeing here that the the in post in, in the post industrial society this schedule is really not realistic for yeah. a lot of people. Yeah. I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. I'll, I'll... I do. In fact, there's a slide that Ev actually shows. Uh, she's now retired, but Ev has a slide where she plots the duration of our, uh, so our BMIs over like a 50, 100 year period. And then she plots the number of, uh, I think it's uh, light, et cetera. And it's very interesting. It's an inverse correlation. What that suggests is as we become more technologically advanced as television, now the smart devices have intruded in our ability to sort of shut off when there's darkness. We're noticing an inverse relationship. So the anthropological association is well-established. Uh, it's an ecological observation. Is it causal? We don't know. Um, and don't ask me how to fix it because I don't know how to do it, okay? All I know how it is to do is avert things by exercise and weight moderation. Thank you, Dr. Punjabi. This was a great setup, not only for the uh, Dean's Lecture on Thursday, but also for the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds next week, where we'll have Dr. Stephen O'Reilly, who looked, was the first one to discover mutations in the leptin receptor, and then followed that evening by a, a roundtable discussion of the role of GLP-1 agonists that I'm sure have a role in sleep and uh and, and other things as well. So we'll, we're gonna tie this all together next week. So this foundational lecture was very important. Remind everybody the MOC and CME uh, uh, link is in the chat and I wish you all a great day. Thank you.